Hi, this is Dr. Bricker here with some hints for homework number seven, which is uh, over a little bit of chapter three, I think three questions from chapter three, just the circular motion part that we didn't cover before, and then chapter six, which is uh, circular motion and forces associated. So let's take a look at this. Okay, the first one says to withstand g-forces up to 10 g's, so 10 times g, so they're telling us this acceleration is 10 times g, so 98 meters per second squared, uh, caused by suddenly pulling out of a steep dive, fighter jet pilots train on humid, on a humid centrifuge, so 10 g's is something like 98 again, uh, meters per second squared. If the length of the centrifuge arm, so the length of the arm, so it's called R, is 12 meters, uh, what is the speed for this kind of acceleration? Okay, let's take a look at this. So again, they're saying the acceleration is 98 meters per second squared. The distance uh, for the arm of the centrifuge, so it's something like, here's the centrifuge out here. In the formula, R is the distance from um, the pivot point to the item that's actually rotating. So this would rotate around in a circle. So the direction is continually changing. Even though the speed is constant, there is an acceleration because the direction is changing. So I always call this radial acceleration, acceleration along the radius towards the center. So the formula we have for this is v squared over r. Luckily, in this um, problem, they give you the r and the acceleration. We just have to figure out what the speed is. So a little bit of algebra, a radial acceleration times r is equal to v squared and then we've got to take the square root of both sides to uh, obtain the speed. Okay, and you see that the units turn out to be uh, meters per second. Number um, 3.40, similar to one that we just did, we're given um, an acceleration 0.6 times g and uh, we're given a diameter of a circle up here so just make sure that you use the radius of the circle. Then it's really the same problem, it's just a different value for radial acceleration, 0.6g, and again, um, use the radius, not the diameter, so 14 meters. Okay, and the last one from chapter 3 concerning circular motion. A particle rotates in a circle with centripetal acceleration, so that's the, that's the acceleration towards the center of 6.8 meters per second squared, and we want to know what happens uh, what is the acceleration if the radius is doubled in part A? So if you double the radius, how much is the acceleration? You know, without changing the speed. Okay, so we keep the speed the same. And then part B, what is the acceleration if the speed is doubled without changing the radius? Okay, so let's, uh, let's see how we can work this out. Okay, so here's the acceleration, 6.8 meters per second squared. And in part... A, we want to make the, the radius twice as big without changing the speed, and uh, part B, we're going to make the speed twice as big without changing the radius. So here's the formula that we have, v squared over r. So this acceleration is inversely proportional to r, that's what this means, inversely proportional to r, and uh, we can use that for part A, and in part B, whoops, it's directly proportional to, it doesn't look very good, directly proportional to the speed squared. Okay, so if you make the uh, radius larger without changing the speed, so if you make the radius twice as big, you can see what happens here. So making the radius twice as big, they're inversely proportional to each other. So without putting any numbers, I'll just say that. Okay, so make the radius smaller, see what happens to the acceleration and in part B if you leave the radius the same but you double the speed um, so doubling the speed this is V squared so uh, you know it just doesn't double the acceleration it's gonna make it four times as big if you have twice the speed because it's you have to square the V part here okay and um, it might seem a little weird we don't know the speed we don't know the R but we know how they're related to each other uh, acceleration and radius, acceleration and v squared. Okay, very good. Okay, so from chapter 6, number 1, 5 meter diameter merry-go-round is turning with a period of 4.5 seconds. So the period, that's the amount of time it takes to go around one time. And then we want to know what is the speed of the child on the rim. 
Okay, so the diameter is 5 meters, so the radius would be uh, 2.5. Half that, the period is 4.5. So if there's a child out here going around, the amount of time it takes to go around once is 4.5 seconds. And uh, again, we know what the, the radius is here. So uh, the speed is going to be the distance that you go around. So it's the distance here, it's the circumference of a circle, divided by the amount of time it takes to go around once. OK, good. So um, 2 pi r, that's the distance around, divided by the amount of time it takes to get around. We also have something called the frequency, which is equal to 1 over the period. You don't need it for this problem. But uh, if, if you needed to find the frequency, it would be 1 over the period. The units here would be 1 over seconds, which is a hertz. Again, you don't need this for this particular problem, but just uh, uh, keep that in mind for other problems. OK, uh, 6.9. Your roommate is working on his bicycle and has the bike upside down. He spins the 60 diameter wheel. So the diameter is 60, so 0 0.60 uh, meters. The radius then would be half that. 0 0.30 meters. Okay, and you notice that the pebble stuck in the tread goes around two times every second. So you go around two times every second. So how many? How long does it take to go around just one time? That's what the period is. So if it's uh, two times every second, the period would be half of a second because that would be the time it would take to go around just one time. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, part A, what is the pebble speed? So that's really similar to what we just did. So it would be the distance around. Again, that's 2 pi r, just like we did in the last problem, and then divided by the, the period. And this one's just a little trickier because we had to figure out the period from the information that was given. And then uh, part B, what is the pebble's acceleration? Okay, very good. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so uh, the diameter of the wheel is 60 centimeters, that's 0 0.60 meters, so the radius would be 0.3. You go around two times every second, so that means it only takes a half a second to go around once. That's the period. So just like the uh, previous problem, the speed would be 2 pi r over the period, and you'll see the units come out correctly, meters per second. And then the acceleration, once you get part a, this would be v squared over r. It's the uh, acceleration towards the center, because the direction keeps changing. Okay, this is kind of a fun one. Uh, the figure is a bird's eye view, so you're looking down on the picture. One, two, three, four there. Moving in horizontal circles on a table, all moving with the same speed. Okay, the same speed. Rank in order from largest to smallest the tension, so T1 through T4. So whenever you go in a circle, there has to be a force towards the center. And in this particular problem, the force towards the center is the tension. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so I've just got the first couple here. You'll have to do the other ones. So let's see what T1 here is. T1, so, it, you know, um, the force towards the center, there has to be a force towards the center. Let me start, like, doing it like this. The net force is MA. That's what we've done before. It's a special kind of A because it's towards the center. So this would be MV squared over R. So I'm just looking at the Newton's second law for this uh picture here. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the force that's towards the center? So this would just be T1. It's the same thing for this thing. Net force, MA, you know, towards the center, MV squared over R. I'm just doing this in general. This is the general formula that we have. We'll have to put in whatever we call these things over here. Uh, so I don't even want to confuse things by doing that. Let me back out and say that that's true, but just, uh, just hold on and you'll see what I'm, what I'm getting at here. So for the first one, the mass is just m. The speed, every, they all have the same speed, so v squared. And then divided by this distance, r. That's equal to t1. And then it's the same formula for the other ones. So for the second one, maybe you'll see why I didn't want to confuse things. Okay, it's still just m. Again, I'm looking at this. It's just m. Same speed, but now the distance is 2r. That's for the second one. Do the same thing for the third one. Just plug these things in. So in, in general, here's the formula. mv squared over r is tension. Go through each one, put in what the m is and what the r is, and uh, the corresponding tension, just like I did here. 
this mass was just m. This, they all have the same speed, v, and it's squared. And then divided by the r. This one is just r. For the second one, it was just m. Same speed again. And then uh, this was 2r. Now the other ones will have different masses, different radiuses. And then rank them from largest to smallest. Just, you know, compare this and this. Like, this one's definitely bigger than this one, etc. And look at the other two. Okay, so uh, 617, we have a 1,500 kilogram car, and it's going around a flat 200 meter diameter track, so that's the diameter, 200 meters, so then the radius has got to be half that, 100 meters, at 22 meters per second, so that's the speed. And they're telling us we're going around a circular track, so immediately think, okay, well, this is a circular motion problem. What is the magnitude of the net force on the car? Okay, let's take a look at it. Good, 1,500 kilograms. We're going around a circular 200 diameter track. Whoops. So that means the radius is equal to 100 meters. And we're going at 22 meters per second. Uh, probably the force that's towards the center is going to be friction. We don't really know what it is here. They don't ask us to, to name what it is, but probably it's friction. Or if it's a banked track, it's some part of the normal force towards the center. They're just asking, what is the net force? In general, though, this is how you set it up. Net force, ma, special kind of a, towards the center, mv squared over r. And then you can put in whatever the force is towards the center. Here they're just saying, what is the net force? So the net force, mv squared over r. And again, they're not making us name it. Just tell us what it is. Find out how much it is. So we know the, the mass, the speed's given, and the radius. So check mark. We can get the net force. Okay, 624. Passengers in a roller coaster can feel 50% heavier okay, than their true weight as the car goes through a dip um, with a radius of 20 meters of the curvature. Okay, so we're going through a, a like a valley. And what's the car's speed at the bottom? So picture you're in a roller coaster car. You're going through a part of a circular dip. At the bottom, you feel 50% heavier. And we want to know what is the speed at the bottom. So, yeah, we're going to need a free body diagram for this one. Okay, so here's the picture. The car's going this way. Now, at the bottom, we can feel 50% heavier. That just means the normal force is 50% bigger than it usually would be. So, if you're just sitting in this car not moving, the normal force is equal to mg. But if you're going around a circular path like this, there has to be a net force towards the center. So the normal force has to be bigger than mg for that to happen. So you have to have an actual net amount towards the center or you don't go in a circle. So I actually drew this to be bigger than that. So they're telling me that the normal force is 50% bigger than um, as I'm moving than if I'm just sitting there. So the normal force is 1.5 mg. Instead of just being mg, it's 50% bigger, so it's 1.5 mg. Okay, so the way to solve this is just like we did in chapter 4 and 5, net force, ma, it's a special kind of a, that's equal to mv squared over r. And then you look for the forces towards the center. So we've got the uh, the net amount this way, the way I drew it. So then, again, this is what's make it, what makes it hard. You have to put in whatever's in this picture. What, whatever goes in from the picture goes into this box here. So I put normal minus mg. That gives me a net amount towards the center. So if, if I'm trying to solve this problem, my first clue is, well, we're going in a circle, so this is really the only thing I have for circular motion. Go back to a free body diagram like we've done before, and then uh, put the stuff in that we know here. And then I'm looking back, what am I even trying to solve for? Well, it's the, it's the speed here. And luckily, the speed comes out in the formula that I've created here. Okay, so it looks like we don't know the mass. And it's kind of a leap of faith at this point. Okay, I don't know the mass. How am I going to do this? Well, let's just put everything in. Maybe the mass will cancel out. If anything ever cancels out, it's the mass. So let me continue this for one more step. So mv squared over r is equal to the normal force, which is 1.5 mg. So I've plugged that in here. And then minus mg. So mv squared over r would just be uh, 0.5 mg. And then the m's actually cancel out. And then you can solve for the speed. Okay, great. So again, there's got to be some net force towards the center. And you can see there is in my picture here. 
Okay, number uh, 6.30. A satellite orbiting the moon very near the surface has a period of 110 minutes. So that's the amount of time it takes to go around the moon once. Uh, use this information together with the radius of the moon, which is actually given in the problem, 1.74 times 10 to the 6th meters, to calculate the free fall acceleration at the moon's surface. So what is the uh, moon's acceleration due to gravity? And yeah, we want it really close to the surface, so we can use sort of a approximate formula for this. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so the period's 110 minutes. That's perfectly good. We just need to turn that into seconds. So one minute, 60 seconds, and then whatever that turns out to be, the minutes cancel out. Here's the uh, size of the moon, 1.74 to the sixth meters. And we want the free fall acceleration at the surface of the moon. So that's the same thing as this, uh, the radial acceleration, v squared over r. So we don't know what v is. But we know the period and the distance around, so we could we could calculate the speed. So the speed would be 2 pi r, that's the distance around, divided by the period, just like we did before. So you could calculate the speed using this and the appropriate period, you know, seconds, and then plug it back in here. Uh, why don't I come up with another formula? Uh, radial acceleration, it's v squared over r, but the v is this thing here. 2 pi r over the period. So I've taken this for v and plugged it in here, and I get 2 pi r over the period, and then don't forget to square it because it's v squared, then divide it by r, so multiply it by 1 over r. So when you uh, put that in and square it, you get 4 pi squared r over the period squared. And this is the way to calculate the free fall acceleration right at the surface. And just again, remember that to put this into seconds. Okay, and you'll see that it's uh, you should get something less than the Earth's g. Okay, so the next one we have the centers of a 15 kilogram lead ball and a 100 gram lead ball are separated by 12 centimeters, so it's the force of gravity. Uh, so what is the gravitational force between them? So anything that has mass is attracted to anything else that has mass. It's just uh, if the masses aren't very big, you can't really feel this. But in things like the uh, Earth going around the sun, that force is large enough. Um, and that's really what's responsible for the Earth going around the Sun, the Moon going around the Earth. So that's the force that's towards the center there. Okay, let's take a look at this. Okay, so the first mass is 15 kilograms, the second one's 100 grams, so divide by 1,000 to get 0.1 kilograms. We need this to be in kilograms. And the distance between them is 12 centimeters, so 0.12 meters. Here's the picture, mass 1, mass 2, distance between them. So here's the formula for the force of gravity. Um, I guess it's usually written with the big G in front, but it doesn't matter. It's usually big G, mass 1, times mass 2, and then divided by the distance between them squared. And this is big G. It's a different constant than little g. Big G is 6.67 to the minus 12th newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Okay, so they're act they actually give us mass 1 and mass 2. Big G is a constant, and then that's the distance between them. Just to keep the notation the same, I'll put R12 there. And you'll see that it's going to be really small. I mean, you can see because this is to the minus 12th here. So you get a really small force. It's there. Uh, if the masses were bigger, like if this were the sun and the earth, then you'd actually have a really big force. And then in part B, they're just really emphasizing how how small this force is. So whatever this force is, this is the force on 1 because of 2. It's the same thing as the force on 2 because of 1. It's a third law pair. So whatever that is that you get for the first part, we want to take that force, the force of gravity, and then divide it by the weight of the 100 gram um, mass. So whatever you get from part A, divide it by the uh, mass of the 100 gram one, which I called mass 2, times 9.8, you know, mg. And then you're going to see that the force of attraction between this mass and this mass is really, 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 really small compared to the actual weight. And the weight is really the uh, force of gravity between this mass and the center of the Earth. Okay. Okay, so the International Space Station is in a 240 mile high orbit. Okay, so mile, you're going to have to turn that into uh, meters. What is the space, uh, what is the station's orbital speed? 
and the radius of the Earth is given. And then part B, what is the uh, orbital period? Okay, so there's got to be a force towards the center on the space station because we're assuming it's going in a circular orbit around the Earth. That's the force that we have here. It's the force of gravity. Okay, let's take a look at this. So here's the picture. Here's the Earth. The space station is up here some distance above the surface of the Earth. So with the Earth, I just said this is the radius of the Earth. And then uh, the height above the Earth, I called H. So as far as this uh, satellite goes, the radius that it's orbiting at, the little r, is actually the radius of the Earth plus the height above the Earth. So the radius of the Earth is given, the height is given, just make sure you turn the, this miles into uh, meters to be able to use it. Okay, mass of the Earth is given, and we want to find the speed and the period. Okay, so something's going in a circle. I always start like this, net force, ma, special kind of a, mv squared over r. And then we've got to figure out what is the force that's towards the center. So um, this is the force on the space station. So the little m here is the mass of the space station. Okay, well, the force that's on the space station, uh, space station is the force of gravity. So that's big G, the first mass, which I'm just going to call it M again, the second mass, and it's the mass of the Earth, and then divided by the distance between them squared. So as far as what am I, what am I going to put in this uh, dotted box here? Well, it's whatever force is on the space station. So if this is the space station, the force towards the center is the force of gravity. Okay, so the farther and farther you are away from the center of the Earth, the less and less this is. We can't just say it's mg. We're too far away. It's little g isn't, isn't the same thing way up here. So it's the force of gravity, which I know is big G, mass of the space station, mass of the Earth, distance between them squared. And again, you'll have to figure out what that is from this. And then we don't need to know the mass of the space station. The m cancels out. So we get V squared over R, cleaning this up a little bit. Big G, mass of the Earth, uh, between the, the distance between them squared. And actually, one of these cancels out. So that cancels with one of those. Good, so the speed turns out to be big G, mass of the Earth, distance between them. And we've got to take the square root of that. OK, so we actually know everything here. Big G, mass of the Earth, divided by the distance between them squared. Now you don't have to go through this every time. If you're if you have something that's orbiting a larger body, the speed, the orbital speed is given by the square root of big G, whatever you're orbiting, divided by the orbital radius. Okay, so again, I just wanted to show you where it came from anyway. Okay, so that's the first part. The second part is to figure out the period. Well, now that we know the speed here, so we get the speed we can go back to what we did before. The speed is the distance around divided by the period. So then the period, doing a little bit of algebra, distance around, that's the circumference of a circle, divided by the speed. OK, and that's, uh, this is what you could use for, for part b. OK, excellent. I think you might be surprised by how, how small this period is. They actually want the answer in minutes. So this will come out in seconds. You'll have to turn it into minutes, and you'll see that it's a pretty small amount of minutes, relatively speaking. Okay, uh, 658. In an old-fashioned amusement park ride, the passengers stand inside a 3-meter tall, 5-meter uh, diameter hollow steel cylinder with their backs against the wall. You might have actually even ridden this ride. If you go to a county fair, usually they have something similar to this there. The cylinder begins to rotate about a vertical axis. Okay, so uh, you, you basically stand in a cylinder and it starts to go in a circle. Then the floor on, the, on which the passengers are standing suddenly drops away. If all goes well, the passengers will stick to the wall and not slide down. Clothing has a static coefficient against steel in the range of 0.6 to 1. Okay. And kinetic coefficient in the range of 0.4 to 0.7.
what is the minimum rotational frequency? So in RPMs, what is the frequency um, for which this ride is safe? Okay, so we'll definitely need a free body diagram for this one. So let's take a look at it. Okay, so basically the, the picture is something like this. This is the cylinder, and you're standing in here. Well, there's you. <laughs> okay, smiling. And there's got to be some force towards the center. Okay, and it's really it's the normal force that's towards the center. So you're going around in a circle like this, uh, you know, up and down, in the way that you're looking at it here. Here it would be the overhead view. So you're standing here, going in a circle. Uh, so I'm looking at kind of the side view here. So normal force, we've got uh, mg here. And what's keeping you from sliding down is static friction. OK, so um, when you go fast enough, there's a normal force towards the center. And uh, you're st the normal force is because you're standing against the back here. Static friction up, mg down. And we want to figure out the minimum rotational speed so that you can make it around. So pretend you're designing this, this ride. So it's static friction. It's not kinetic friction. So we don't actually need these values. Now, if you're designing it, you want to be safe. You want to pick mu sub s of 0.6. Assume it's the least amount of friction, right? And then um, then you'll be okay. If, if you assume there's a lot of friction, you might not be okay. So let's let's take the coefficient of static friction to be 0.6 as the designers of this ride. Okay, so if, if you're going around, we want static friction to be equal to mg. You know, we don't want to be, we don't want to fall down. So that's perfectly good. Um, this is looking at uh, balancing these horizontal forces, sorry, vertical forces. Horizontally speaking, we do have a net force because we're going in a circle. So net force is MA, that's MV squared over R. And then what is the force towards the center? Well, it's the normal force that's towards the center. Okay. So looking back at what we're trying to solve for is the frequency. Well, if I can figure out the speed, I know that the distance around divided by the period gives me the speed, or you know, multiply it by the frequency. So if I can get the uh, the speed, I can figure out what the what the frequency is. Good. So as far as solving this problem, okay, I write down what I know. We're going in a circle, so I have a clue that I'm going to have to use some rotational dynamics here. And what I'm trying to figure out is the frequency. And if I can get the speed, I can get the frequency. So there's the free body diagram going again in that circle again. So um, from balancing hor vertical forces, static friction is equal to mg. I also know that static friction has to be uh, less than or equal to the normal force times mu sub s. This is what I had in chapter 5. So I've got a lot of stuff going on here. Okay, so let's see from this if I could actually figure out uh, how much the speed's going to be. So mv squared over r. Okay, I'm looking pretty good. I don't know what m is yet, uh, but I am given the radius, and I don't know the normal force. So this is a good start. I'm looking for v. Here's a formula that has v in it. It's just I also don't know the normal force, and I don't know the mass. So I've got one equation with multiple unknowns in it. I can't solve that. I'm going to have to get some more equations to be able to, to do this. Okay, so if you're doing this on your own, you might try a few other things. Looking at this equation, why don't I plug in mv squared over r for the normal force? I can do that here. I'll take this for the normal force and plug it in. Okay, so normal force, mv squared over r, and I still have a mu sub s here. And I know the static friction has got to be equal to mg, so why don't I plug that in for static friction here? Again, I'm just kind of you know playing around with the equation, seeing how I can solve it. Um, and then if you notice, the m's actually cancel out. I didn't know what the normal force was, so I'm plugging this in for the normal force. I'm eliminating the normal force from, from consideration. And uh, in one move, I've really cleaned things up a lot. The m's have canceled out. I've got a g here, a mu sub s here, and there's the v I'm looking for. So let me multiply both sides by r, divide by mu sub s, and then I have this uh, less than or equal to 
the velocity squared. And then I can actually solve it. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. The radius is given. Mu sub s, I deduce what that has to be. So I can solve, uh, this is v squared, but I could solve for v. gr over mu sub s, square root of that is equal to v. Good, so then once I get v, I could go back here and figure out what the frequency is. So again, the frequency is equal to, uh, well, let me start with this. The speed is equal to 2 pi r times the frequency. So then the frequency would be equal to v over 2 pi r. And as you can see there, just doing a little bit of algebra. Okay, great. Now this is going to come out in 1 over seconds. We, we actually want um, revolutions per minute. This is revolutions per second because I've got everything in SI units. We've got to turn it into revolutions per minute. So I'll leave that part to you. So again, this is revolutions per second. You, you want revolutions per minute, so you have to multiply whatever you get here by 60 to put it into to revolutions per minute. That's what an RPM is. Okay, lots going on in this problem. It took a whole page, actually. Um, lots of different concepts. Make sure you get the units correct, and um, pat yourself on the back when you get, the, get it correct, because it is a difficult problem. Uh, the last one, we've got a 20, or sorry, 0.2 kilogram hockey puck, it looks like. On a frictionless horizontal table connected to a string through a hole just like the picture shows and we've got a 120 gram mass that's hanging down sorry 1.2 kilogram hanging mass and uh, with what speed must the puck rotate in a given radius 0.55 millimeters if the puck is to remain hanging at rest so basically the puck is going in a circle and if there's really no friction, it's hard to maybe picture this on Earth because uh, there's friction. You can get this to go for a little while, though, until it falls. If this is going around in a circle, there's got to be some force towards the center. It's the tension here that provides the force towards the center. This will keep going in a circle as long as there's some tension here. Now, if there's friction, it's going to die off and head towards the center. But if there's absolutely no friction, this will just keep going. The force that's towards the center, again, is tension. So let's sketch this. Okay, so I called the uh, puck mass 1, here's mass 2, and here's tension towards the center. Okay, so and we want to figure out how fast this is going. Okay, so again, there's no speed formula in this chapter, the circular motion chapter, but you know speed's going to come into play because we have net force, ma, special kind of a, mv squared over r, and there's the v that we're looking for. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the force that's towards the center? And this problem, the force towards the center, is T. So be careful, this is T for tension, it's not T for period. This is the tension, force towards the center. Okay, good. If we're, so if we're looking for speed, here's the speed. And again, this is, I'm writing this formula for mass 1, so let me make it clear. That's for mass 1. We know the uh, radius, we know mass 1. We could get the speed if we knew the tension, but we don't know the tension. So again, this is one of those one equation and two unknown problems. So luckily, we have this other mass we could take a look at. So the free body diagram for this other mass, so for mass 2, we have tension this way, m2g this way, the weight that way. So the tension is actually equal to m2 times g. Well, good, so then I can figure out this tension, right? It's m2 times g. I know what that tension is. And then you can take that and plug it in here. If you want, we can uh, plug it in symbolically. So instead of t, it's m2g. So perfectly good to just figure out a value for t, plug it in, and then do some work to get v. I'm just taking this for t, m2g, and plugging it in right away. Okay? And then, uh, then I can solve for, for v. So v squared would be m2g times r divided by m1. And then you'll have to take the uh, square root of both sides. Okay, so uh, 13 questions. Some are relatively simple. Some are rel really kind of hard, actually. So uh, email me if you have any questions, and I'll talk to you soon.